Sachen hier ans Kleid ja. oder hört man das dann sofort? Was ich, ähm, ich will. Also, ich, dann, was dann geredet wird, wird auch gehört. Okay. Dann ähm, rede ich nicht und weiß, dass ich alles. Okay, dann meinst du. Aber ich glaube, wir warten noch ein paar Minuten, bis alle sitzen, oder? Wie machen wir das schon? Warte mal, ist das hier jetzt an? Ich glaube nicht, ich kann es anmachen. Kannst du es mal anmachen, bitte? Ja. Für alle, die jetzt neu gekommen sind, Good evening for everybody who just came in. There are headsets in the lobby, so please help yourself. There will be several languages spoken, so please get your headsets. Everything will be translated uh, uh, tonight, and everybody who doesn't have a headset yet, uh, please go and get uh, your headset. It would be also really, really nice if you all to sit down so that we can start. So, wir müssen irgendwo vielleicht, geht das so? Ah ja. Die Kabel sind vorne, du siehst wahrscheinlich, ob das unter Spannung ist. immer noch nicht an. Nee. Ja, das ist an. Good evening, everybody. Ja. ja, aber dann hört das, dann ist das zu tief, ne? So, und jetzt... Nee, das geht so nicht, nee, das ist nicht laut genug. Kann irgendjemand irgendwas hören so? Nein, ich muss jetzt hier diskret in mein Kleid flüstern, das klappt noch nicht richtig. Okay, can anybody hear me now? I think it's working now, it's loud enough. 
Good evening. Herzlich willkommen. Welcome everybody. Welcome Europe actually. It's amazing to see how many of you apparently have not given up the European idea yet. How many of you apparently don't belong to the European pessimists? I'll try my best with this mic and you just protest whenever I do anything disturbing. So after these amazing and most troubled European years we have all witnessed, Europe seems to be alive. Good evening to a panel about decroissance, postwachstum, decrescimento, decrescita. And if I might say, next time we meet, I think we should have all the Russian and Polish and Ukraine movements and activists here as well. But we start. <laughs> but we start more or less with old Europe. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator tonight. My name is Elisabeth von Taden. I'm a journalist and editor of the German weekly Die Zeit, where I mostly write about issues of ecological and economic and cultural transformation. I'm a fellow of the Jena Research Group on post-growth as well. And most of all, I'm your moderator tonight and very proud to be with you. All degrowth, but different. We want to have a closer look and learn about what the different European degrowth movements have in common, look at their particular traditions, find out about four different traditions and their backgrounds. And I'm very much looking forward to see how we deal with our little language experiment. And the language experiment goes as follows. Juan sitting next to me, the Spanish Catalan guy is going to speak English. Francois on my right hand side is going to speak French, his mother tongue. Nico Pech is going to speak his mother tongue, Deutsch, German, and Mauro from Italy will speak Italian. It will all be translated into something. And <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll I'm sure you sort it out and find the issue which it might be interesting to you. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce four gentlemen to you. I'll be back to this problem a little bit later. <laughs> but before <laughs> But before I start introducing them, let me just give you one last practical hint. The interpretation translation channels are as follows. Zero is German, two is English, three is French, four is Italian. I repeat, zero is German, two is English, three is French, four is Italian, which means we are missing Spanish, well, we are missing Russian and Ukraine and Polish as well, but these four will do. So, is it loud enough? Does anybody hear me? Tommy, can you hear me? Louder? So can I have, a, can I have another mic? The green one, please. Can you hear me? No. Um, no idea. Green one works. The green mic works. So. I'm sure we'll be started in a minute. So, 
One last practical remark is the following thing. This evening will be divided into two parts. The first part will be in here, a panel discussion. And the second part, in order to make sure that you can all contribute, will be outside in the foyer, a world cafe. All the panelists will be at the desks ready for discussing and we would like everybody to discuss at least, well, well at least first to, to, to put your questions, of course, and then to discuss how can these different traditions we are going to um, learn about tonight, how can they learn from each other and, and which aspects have been underrepresented in our discussion. So this can, all these things can be discussed outside. We'll be here together for at least one hour and then have another hour outside. And now we get started. On my right side, François Schneider. He represents Décroissance. He is the man with the monkey, Jujube, who went on a walk for degrowth in southern France a couple of years ago. But he did not only go on a walk with a monkey, he is the co-founder of the monthly La Décroissance. I suppose you all know it. Le journal de la joie de vivre, joie de vivre, unnecessary to translate, I hope so. He is, moreover, the co-founder of the research unit, Research and Degrowth in the Universita Autonoma de Barcelona and a recycling expert. I'm sure we'll learn about more about the differences between the voluntary path of independence from growth and the involuntary experience of living in a shrinking economy in recession times. To his right, si right side, Nico Pech, who I suppose I don't have to introduce, he's the man who once on a conference night under a starry sky wondered why I needed an iPhone. And I didn't really know how to answer. Happily enough, we got lost that night and my iPhone found the way back, so that at least was part of an answer. Nico Pech is professor of economics at the University of Oldenburg, holds a chair on production and environment. He is probably envied by most of his colleagues because wherever he appears, the lecture halls are chock full. And my own news newspaper, Die Zeit, declared him to be the weltweit einer der Lichtgestalten in der Postwachstumsdiskussion. <laughs> So, <laughs> impossible to translate Lichtgestalt into any other language of the world. It's something Schweinsteiger-like or Götze-like, I suppose. <laughs> he is the one, he is the one who proposes sincerely to demolish or remove highways and airports. I hope we're going to hear something about that tonight proposes to reduce working hours as well. And I'm very interested in hearing from him tonight how our Greek friends think about growing vegetables in their gardens. To my left-hand side, I'm honored to present Juan Martinez Alier, who represents the decrescement tonight, a man whom I suppose you know because he is one of the fathers of what we are thinking and discussing about tonight. He is the European inventor, one of the most important at least of what all of us bothers. He works as a professor of economics and economic history at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He is, I suppose you know, author of books like Ecological Economics, and the environmentalism of the poor has been traveling as a teacher and researcher around the whole world, is an institution founder as well, one of the very political figures of our movement. And most of all, he has built the intellectual bridges between European ecology and global environmental justice movements. And to our left, Mauro Bonaiuti, he represents the Crescita, he is the man who 
joins us today in spite of being needed at home for family matters and I'm very glad you came in spite of the better reasons to stay at home. He is an economist teaching at the Italian universities of Modena, Bologna and Torino. He was a student of Nicolas Georgescu Rügen, one of the founders of, of bioeconomics. Mauro has founded the Italian Associazione per la Decrescita and supports the Rete Italiana di Economia Solidale, which makes me wonder how he makes the difference between the other huge Italian movement, which is very near Beppe Grillo, and I think we'll have to talk about populist movements and even right-wing movements and their um, and um, their relations to our degrowth issues tonight. Tonight, so here we go. Now we start, and I would like Francois to tell us first, and everybody will do. Every of these gentlemen, where do you come from? What is the origins? What is the history of your movement, degrowth movement at home, and? I would like you to be, all of you, as national as you, as you can be tonight, though I hope you're mostly <laughs> European. Tell us the French story. Where do you come from, Francois? Pardon, Francois, j'ai oublié. Je suis très ému, en tout cas, par, par cette conférence. Bonjour, bonjour. Je suis, je suis très ému de voir... Euh, I'm very delighted to see so many of you and I'd like to welcome you all. I'm not uh, very happy that there are more and more people, but I'm more more happy that there are so many young people here who look like they are really ready to do something for degrowth. There are many young motivated uh, people here. A lot of efforts were needed. It started since the beginning of the century to bring this in uh, to life. And I really hope that our struggle for solidarity will continue in the future. I'd like to add one more thing. I'm not going to only speak about uh, France or the French tradition only. There are many Francophone countries, not only France. And under these French countries, there's not only one single tradition. There are many traditions who have contributed to this degrowth idea and also to the development of the degrowth idea. This wasn't started by... Um, scholars. It started already in the 1990s and there were people who were really questioning the transportation system. There were people who then founded De Croissant. This was the anti-car movement and that later it was followed by the ad busting uh, movement and all this then later led to the fact that, that that, for example, as part of this at, bus, uh, at busting uh, movement, there was a letter that was sent to a minister. And there was a demand for a decrease by 4%. The Casa de Poupe, uh, that was the name of this at busting movement. And it all started with the publishment of a magazine by Bassar Clément. It was a very small magazine, actually, and it was called Ceylon, which means silence. Until then, that uh, magazine was only known by a small circle and relatively unknown, actually. And this special edition, it dealt with the topic of degrowth, and it was quoted in many different um, publications, for example, like uh, Vicon. 
and Le Monde as well. And afterwards, there was a conference. There was a very significant conference at UNESCO in Paris. This conference was called Making Development to Reverse Development, basically. So it was organized by an alliance of um, activists who are against uh, cars in the inner cities and also against uh, advertisements. And they all joined forces with uh, scholars who were all friends of François Patron or of Jacques Collin and many other French scholars. And these scholars, for many, many years, uh, fought against this development idea. They were against commodification and also the economization. And they were also against the concept of the homo economicus. And that was perceived as an omnipresent uh, phenomenon. There was another conference in 2003 in Lyon. Bonaiuti was present as well. There were many people from Italy that joined that conference. This conference took place at a uh, mayor's building, and the halls were really, really pompous, like really, really lovely and lavish. And we were quite impressed, actually, to get such a venue. It was very important to really um, hold this conference within that context. This conference was dedicated to Jean Jouron Rousseau. And what happened afterwards? Well, there was another significant uh, publication of a degrowth book, followed by a uh, journal des croissants, which was published. And as you know, I also traveled around with the donkey, which was my mode of transport back then. and not donkey. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'll try not to do it again. <laughs> so he was on a walk, walk with a donkey. Anyway, Gigi. I went, I went, I went for, for one year. Uh, it was something I wanted to do for a long time. Ah oui, maintenant je me mets à parler anglais, ça va. C'est parti. Voilà, et... Um, non, c'était... Well, the idea at the beginning was to make degrowth break out of this crisis and bring it to a broader audience. And many said that, well, we are such a small minority, they won't listen to you. And it was really nice to see when I addressed a certain question because I, what I did was the people I met during my donkey uh, tour I asked them would, are they in favor of uh, an increase in cons uh, of consumption or a decrease and many said in rich countries well we have to reduce consumption and that was very contrary to the idea that I had prior to my trip and also that what other people had planned. And that surprised me, but it also allowed me to meet many small groups who worked in the degrees movement. There were many discussions in villages, in the quartiers, and for me, that was a very important experience. And it was also really nice to come in contact with so many people and to find such a broad mass and discuss this idea with so many people. This all culminated in a huge march with uh, 500, 500 people in Monique, and there were many different people who had speeches at Villa 2. Ola Tush, who was a person who was there as well, and it was really impressive uh, to get there, really, and uh, be part of uh, the circle of these huge personalities. 
And I'm not quite sure whether I should go into detail here. Nevertheless, in 2006, Tony Bayon joined us. He was one who started the anti-car movement. What we then decided to do was to do um, to found our research movement, uh, our research group on degrowth. And what I wanted to do is to bring in all my contacts that I gathered throughout the time, especially get the input of the people from the ecological movement. And we organized a conference in Paris. And at the beginning, we thought, we're just going to have a small seminar with about 30 people. We invite some more famous people. And at the end of the day, well, we had, of course, uh, uh, support from um, John Matisse Allier and other people from the world of academics, such as uh, Mr. Sachs, and that allowed us uh, to really have a huge success. There were about 150 people who came, and they all brought in their, or their own ideas. There were many interested people, and this call for joining us uh, really, really um, uh, allow for so many people to come together who were interested in degrowth. And publications emerged from that again. And maybe we can talk about that later. So this is a history of a movement. Now, how was the situation in Germany? Now I switch to ugly German. <laughs> so if we want to see how the growth, um, post-growth economy st uh, started in Germany, then we can see that it's tightly linked to the eco-environmental -env uh, movement. And it all started with this cartoon, which was really funny. It was published in the 1960s in a, a very huge uh, newspaper. And the cartoon uh, is as follows. There's a man who co comes to the bank with a water pistol, and he says, 100,000 uh, euros. And then the bankier says, it's just a, a pistol. But then he, that uh, man is saying that there's water from the River Rhine. So the pollution of the Rhine was the event at the end of the 1960s that led Willy Brandt, back then the chancellor, to say that the, Rhine, the River Rhine will, will become clean um, and then after that was followed by the report of Upper Front. And then the issue of degrowth then became very important. That was followed by the anti-nuclear movement. So the degrowth movement was linked with the question is economic growth really good for a good life? Interestingly, the growth debate after the Club of Rome gained uh, support, uh, and there were a lot of good literature published. There were a, a book from Eric Fromm, Fritz Schumacher. They all published really uh, inter interesting books, Herbert Krohm uh, uh, and Mr. Krohm. And all these books were translated into German. And there was also the energy crisis, 1974, 1975. And that also put some fi um, coal on the fire. So and enlightened that, um, ignited that discussion. Now, at the end of the 1970s then, there was um, the, the de degrowth critique decrease. And why that? Well, in the 1970s in Germany, Erhard Applet started a debate, and he f asked the question, is growth uh, ecologically uh, so uh, problematic, could it be possible to have a qualitative good economy so that the economy and also the society can be sustained, especially the consumption system, and uh, w maybe also increase values that uh, have a value and sold on a market and also require investment and don't harm the, uh, the ecology. 
Now, this discussion led to uh, reducing the degrowth debate in the academic uh, circles. As a student in the 1980s, I was confronted with so many significant uh, Dutch um, ecologists, and they already um, developed, developed very interesting degrowth um, um, phenomena. Now, there were many, many other publications which I want to mention also during this time. Now, let me also tell you the uh, highlight of this uh, movement. There was a report, the Bundland Report, and that brought uh, a new vision of uh, sustainability. And for many people, through that report, they understood that it would be, it is good to have a good life through technical innovation. So the entire environmental ecology um, movement was then um, a, a uh, was then made alive, and many continued with this debate. Now, for Germany, I'd like to mention Marianne Grönemeyer. She published a phenomenal book at the end of the 1980s, "The Power of Needs," um, and there's no no mention of sustainability uh, there. But this is still a significant um, piece of literature. In the when I was about 30, there was a book that was published which also pu put a perspective of uh, an economy without growth. Alfred Lux is another one who I want to mention. He wrote a PhD thesis on the future of growth. Wolfgang Sachs was mentioned already, and I also mentioned Mr. Binz. In the 1990s, in the middle of the 1990s, something very important happened. A very significant person who unfortunately died recently, Hans-Peter Dürr and Christiane Poschitti, they then founded the, the, the Association of Economic Ecology, which was not seen as a, de, as a degrowth, um, or to have a degrowth perspective. However, it prepared quite a lot and passed the way for the enlivening of the de, um, degrowth debate. Until then, the concept of um, renewable energies and the uh, people thought the growth problem could be solved by that. And then there was another phase that happened afterwards where there was a bit of a, a difficult uh, time that happened there. And theoretically and empirically, it's difficult to uh, to decouple couple economic growth from uh, uh, technology. And then there was Mr. Oldenburg, who tried to establish an idea for a growth, uh, an economy without growth. And this is when the post-growth uh, term emerged. So th it was not about reinventing the wheel again. It was about showing and bringing together what was already uh, created uh, in terms of theory in the field of um, degrowth. And a lot of new things came to, uh, uh, w were added as well. Now. The growth critique in Germany was basically f um, shaped by the disappointment with regard to the decoupling. Now, the first phase of the growth um, period, the peak oil and peak everything um, phenomena were not heard. Fred Hirsch, for example, in the 1970s published a, blog, a book social limits to growth, but the idea of uh, um, um, disappeared. But that idea was picked up by other theorists, and it was then followed to discuss um, growth um, in different uh, fields. Francois, for example, he thought about maybe growth is not only a failure to stop equality, but maybe can be the price for economic growth to ha having to sustain more inequality. I come from, um, macro e from the macroeconomic field, and I made a lot, I, I research a lot uh, in that area, like um, Atya Sen, and I realized the um, same point. Now, with the happiness uh, theory, uh, psychological growth uh, issues are being discussed now.
Well, it seems I, I've um, used up all of my time, so I can only make one brief debate. So, so the debate on deceleration, research on happiness, and the numerous findings on the exhaustion of our society and the exhaustion of individuals, all of this has converged um, to point out to us numerous limits to growth, and there's an academic debate on those limits now. And so we now, we now have a very a thriving debate on growth and the limits to growth and the need of for degrowth in Germany from 2006 onward following the financial crisis it became more and more clear that the instability of the financial regime might also be related to the fact that we are as it were worshiping the growth paradigm and it was then that in Germany the notion of a post-growth society and a post-growth economy it's a concept um, coined by Angelika Seidel and others and the notion of wealth without growth and concepts such as degrowth became popularized were popularized in Germany more and more books actually <laughs> is it the same is it the same in Spain <laughs> well I think it will also start taking a more European point of view because there is the, the history of, of, of the growth and they put decrescement here which is the Catalan name and in Spanish is called decrecimiento or in Mexico they call it descrecimiento and uh, so it's the same word that we use in French or in Italian and, uh, and there is a lot of influence in Spain of course from the French decroissance movement because it start, started earlier but even before it started as Francois Schneider explained in the early 2002 as, a, as an activist movement and this is what we should, to, should, we should be talking about this because this is a, a political meeting I understand as I see it more than a, an academic meeting or an activist meeting uh, and this is what it should be and we are sort of celebrating the, the birth or it's not the birth but the, the growing of a movement that uh, there is this European tradition. And in one of the sessions was already explained, as in the first day, that was Andre Gortz, mm -hmm. who was not called Andre Gortz really, but he was an Austrian and a Jewish refugee in France. So a very European kind of person who had another name, Michel Bosquet, when he was writing for the yeah, Nouvel Observateur. And in 72, there was a meeting because they were talking about the report to the, the medal report to the Club of Rome. And in the same meeting, there was Herbert Marcuse, there was Edgar Morin, who was already talking about complexity, and some, what we see in retrospect, young, older people like Marcuse and very young people like Edgar Morin at the time. And Gortz said that perhaps we should have decroissants. He said to keep the balance, the equilibrium in the ecosystem, perhaps we should have not only zero growth, as he thought that the Meadow report was saying, but uh, decroissance. He said, voir decroissance. And this is, we think, the first time that the word was used. And not in a small meeting, it was a meeting larger than that one, according to the Nouvelle Observateur that you can find here in the, in the <coughs> In, in, in the university library perhaps, or perhaps it is already an internet of 72, June 72, and the meeting had 3,000 people in Paris. Perhaps it was a mutualité. I was not there. I could have been, but I was not there. And <coughs> because I was not in Paris, that was the main reason. And, so, and in that same meeting, somebody who was very European, because it was Sico Manskov, the president at the time of the European Commission, and he was a sort of Dutch uh, uh, unionist, uh, agrarian unionist, which you would know about, no, Dutch, yes. And he said 
that he was as president of the European Commission at the time, they have deteriorated very much in the meantime, he said that uh, he was for below zero growth in French, below zero growth. And there was a debate because George Marché from the Communist Party in France said, I am totally shocked by this. This cannot be, we have to grow. And also Giscard d'Estaing, who was the president, said, another minister of finance said, this is scandalous, below zero growth. What does it mean, the growth? And also uh, Raymond Barr, who was the commissioner for economy in the European Commission, also dismissed Sico Manskol, who lasted only for about six months as president of the, the European Commission. So he was very much influenced by the report to the, to the Club of Rome by the Meadows, and both simultaneous, that book with the book by Georgescu Regan, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, which is 71, on books by other, pe other people like Howard Todom or Barry Komona. So that is the, our, uh, sort of with Ivan Elich and other people, are the people who are, we come from, more or less, in all the traditions, at least intellectually. But of course, the growth is not only about books or articles or things like this, it's about practice. So this is something I want to say, this common European origin, or even North American origin, although the Americans, the North Americans, have talked rather about the steady state and not the croissants. Why in German you don't use the croissants? Because you use the word foyer, for instance. Now we're going to go to the foyer, foyer, or you have a place called Saint Souci in Potsdam. So you have some French words, you could adopt the croissants perhaps, but I'm not a German philologist, so I don't know the rules. When you can adopt, or you could use cre cre the crecita, like andante, yeah. andante con moto, the crecita felice, or the crecita, sustainable. So, but nevertheless, because post-vaxtum is a bit different perhaps, it sounds to me a bit different and, and a more of a compromise. The croissants is a more obus, as they say in French, is a missile word, something very difficult to recuperate. As already Nico explained that sustainable development, which was an oxymoron from the beginning on, was meaning everything and nothing in particular but a bit contradictory, not so much as green growth, eh, which is a super oxymoron, but uh, <coughs> it's uh, easier to interpret in different ways. But de croissant is very difficult, or de crecimiento, de crecimiento, de crecita, is very difficult to recuperate and to use in a sort of conservative or eco-efficiency kind of approach. Well, from Chico Manskul, is very, the Dutch are not here, apparently in the table at least, but Hutin, and then Hutin influenced Christian Leipert, and Christian Leipert was one of the founders of the Ecology Institute, Ecological Economics Institute in Berlin. I was a member of the Beirat for a while, but let me talk just five minutes, if I have them for about Catalonia and Spain. So all these things are known, in, in, of course, in Spain, about Georgescu Regan, has been translated into Spanish long ago, the book, the big book, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. And some people, of course, have come to, to this movement of decrecimiento or decrecimiento through reading books, like myself, uh, or, but also through experiences in other places, not only in Spain, in Latin America quite a lot. But there are also a lot of grassroots experiences. Some of them have been here. There is in Catalonia something, a group called themselves the Cooperativa Integral. Cooperativa Integral, is it to understand? And they are very active. There are perhaps 2,000 people, 3,000 people trying to live outside of the uh, capitalist economy, the money economy, not to get indebted with the banks and so on. And this happens everywhere. And here there is also Chema Ber Berrio, which I talked a little bit before I started to talk, who is from, <coughs> from the Basque country or from Navarre. And there is also a lot of women. I saw, a, they gave me a book here, published very recently, yeah. And they have a map about uh, Spain, and this map is in internet, in a place called mapunto.net. 
and there there are, there are like hundreds of experiments in the country, of course, as was explained also on the first day, provoked by the economic crisis. People have to make a living somehow, and they are trying, many people are trying to make a living, including the squatters movement, including people in, 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 in Andalusia with the countryside and in many places. So this is growing. And intellectually, also politically, it's growing in two ways. One would be, quite recently, something was published called The Last Call Manifesto, written by Jorge Rigman and other people, in, in people from the university. This has been signed by the new people in Podemos, which, which is a kind of Spanish Syriza. They have now five members of parliament in the European Parliament. They signed it. Ada Colau from Catalonia also signed, who is going to be, if we are a bit lucky, the next mayor in Barcelona, coming from the anti-evictions uh, movement because of the mortgages. Ada Colau, remember the name. And has been signed also by members of the old post-communist left, and even some members of the Socialist Party. And this manifesto, which is also in German and English and other languages, is called Last Call Manifesto, a little bit apocalyptic, but this is what it's called. It's been very, very successful. Many people have joined it. That's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing is that resistance is not only alternatives, but the alternatives grow from the resistances in all over the world, in India, in Latin America, and there are thousands, thousands of environmental conflicts around the world, and some more now in Europe and in the South than before. I think that Nantes has been mentioned, or Rosia Montana. There is in Europe a group, they call themselves the, <coughs> the, the network against Grand Projet Unutile Imposé, which means grand, uh, great public works which have been imposed and we don't want, isn't it? Like the Stuttgart station. I don't know what happened with the Stuttgart station, but the beginning was very encouraging, isn't it, of the resistance. So these, the alternatives come from the resistance. And there has been examples in Spain, for instance, in Corcoesto, in the, in the northwest of Spain, in Galicia, because they wanted to do gold mining and they said gold mining, we don't want gold mining here, or not anywhere, because gold is quite absurd to mine gold and then goes to Zurich again to, to the to down the earth, isn't it? And, and there have been now, right now, there are complaints in the Canary Islands against oil explorations, and also in Mallorca, which is more or less a German territory, and, <laughs> and, and they want to take oil from, from, from the sea to make explorations. So what Nemo Basse said here of oil in the soil and coal in the hole and gas under the grass and all these mm -hmm. nice expressions can be applied also to Europe, of course. It should be applied to Europe. And this is the main, I think, a sort of driving force for a post vacuum or, or an economy of <laughs> decrescement. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being so European in what you were saying and on putting the focus on resistance. Mauro, what about Italy? Um, I think everybody is already regretting that we can't spend the night here together. We have to be short and still we'll have a second round to go deeper into the political issues. So. Italy's history of degrowth first and then a second round on the panel. Mauro. Yes. Bene. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here and I'm very honored to be here as well. After about a 10 year walk and back then in Italy we started the association for degrowth, the Associa de Crescieta. We founded this association. We founded this uh, association in 2004 and that is uh, 10 years back. 
I remember the meeting in Paris in 2002. Back then, I met Francois and also Latouche and many other friends from this small group of economists. And we met uh, within the framework of uh, Toulon, a magazine, and we organized the first conference. And I remember the first speech on that very uh, unbelievable uh, meeting, Ivan Gilvich uh, spoke, and I think it was his last public uh, appearance. You all know that Illich back then was very ill. He had a tumor. And part of his face was affected and was a bit distorted. Nevertheless, he spoke at that meeting. And as you know, he never underwent uh, um, surgery or had any uh, intervention. And I remember that silence in this huge hall when he uh, took up the floor and the audience really listen to his words. After this meeting, the follow, uh, there was a conference, uh, the Conference of Lyon the following year, and that was dedicated to degrowth exclusively. So degrowth also appeared in the title of the conference. Now with some of the friends who are here today as well, we then founded the first uh, association for degrowth in Italy. Today, we have two such associations in Italy. One is the Association for Degrowth, and the other one is the Movement for uh, Happy Degrowth, which was founded two years later. We then also formulated and discussed uh, theoretical questions. I remember w one thing in particular. Right from the beginning, it was clear, from my perspective at least, it was clear that these uh, meetings would have to bring in different uh, ways of thinking, different streams and currents. And there were two big currents that uh, converged. One is the ecological critique of growth and development, especially represented by the bioeconomists, the followers of Giorgio Economa. And then there was the growth detractors who came from the tradition of Ivan Illich and Sergio and who dealt with the topic of, of degrowth and discussed issues of the, such as the political failure in Africa, for example. Now, the conclusion was drawn that growth as such is the problem. Growth paradigm is the problem. So there was a dialogue between these two streams and also conflicts were identified. So the degrowth movement was brought together different uh, ideas. So we can say, basically, And I'm saying this based on my knowledge of the Spanish and the Italian m movement, and also the Italian movement, of course. We are children who emerge from these two streams and currents. And that was a very important development. And maybe later we can continue talking about this. Thank you very much. of common European traditions and diversity. Two names always turning up, turning up again in what you say, Andre Gors and Ivan Illich. I would 
nevertheless now like to put the stress on the political main conflicts and the political main issues of what you are debating at present in your movements, institutions, whatever. So how practical um, is degrowth? How political is it? What are you, you debating? Which are the main areas of conflict? Let's talk about the contents and the substance of what is being discussed at present in your countries. countries. Would you like to start again, please, François? Vous discutez de quoi en France? Décroissant um, exists of diversity, basically. Décroissant is diversity, and it's a diversity that is very interesting. There is diversity with regard to topics, the interests, the worries. There's one worry with regard to human relations. It's not only that there's only not only a market relationship, And we have to decolonize colonize our images. For example, with De Coluche, as Mauro has mentioned, there is also the idea of bioeconomy, of uh, the resources that we have, they should not uh, be reduced. There are, we also have the Greens that are here with us. And there's another stream that hasn't, men hasn't been mentioned yet. And this is about the meaning of life and giving life meaning, and also giving life a certain coherence. We shouldn't only be stuck in contradictory, uh, contradictory social roles. and. But uh, the, this was um, this idea or this stream was um, defended by various uh, scholars, actually. There was a criticism of the democratic idea, and this led to many critical debates. There was also another idea was is also very important. It's the idea of justice. We are against feudalism. We are against um, isolation. That we are these are all phenomena that that we are faced with at the moment. The central debates that we have currently in Spain, in French, uh, and also Belgian and, and Swiss network, and also in Canada and also other parts of the world. I don't really think that there are any uh, special debates here. Nevertheless, there are different um, emphasis in different countries. For example, in France, there is a critique of the utilitarianism. This maybe is a speciality or something that is particular. Debates are meant to advance um, our ideas as well, especially the debates that are led among the different streams. Now, what are the concrete debates, or what, or what were the concrete debates that we discussed, or that are being discussed? Now, these debates that are taking place, they are asking the question, how, to what extent do we want to enter these institutions? How important is it to deal with the question of power and power structures? What are other conflicts? Well, most of the conflicts that we are faced with are not about values necessarily. Everybody agrees that we need com complementarity because if we leave out uh, justice, then we 
are doomed to go in that direction. Now, we are. The debate is also about how individually we should get involved, whether the strategies should be more practical or more theoretical. And uh, these conflicts are calling for a dialogue. What we need we need to achieve is to combine these different approaches. And when we do that, we'll then be able to create something new. These debates are everywhere because we are now in a society of specialization, of uh, differentiation. And I really think that we really have to do, do more work in that field. Well, let's uh, stop here, and maybe Francois, you can say something later, and maybe Nico, you can tell us what's happening in Germany. Why is everybody laughing? Well, what can I say about Germany? Well, many people are laughing because in Germany, it is not possible to structure all these different debates. Well, when we look at the degrowth uh, critique that we are currently finding within the post-growth economy, there's a lot that we meet. Uh, they start from Karl Marx until Konrad Adenauer. I mean, this is how uh, wide range the debate is. In Germany, we have the Marxist-oriented um, growth um, critique, and even in the conservative Christian uh, party. Sorry. Now, there's a, that was a joke which uh, is a bit difficult to get because it's a national joke. Well, so what I want to say that there is conservative uh, growth critique. So if we were to structure that maybe a little bit, maybe we could maybe find three uh, differences here, and there we can see what the differences are. Now, the first question is, from an analytical point of view, we're talking about the critique of culture, we're talking about the critique of exorbitance, and we are living beyond our means, basically. We need to change our uh, lifestyle, or we need to critique the system where we see the human being who is a prison in that system and who has no choice then to just go along, basically. So who are the actors and what are the pr approaches? On the one hand, we have a lifestyle debate, which was um, supported in the 90s through um, the ideas of uh, subsistence, and then also things can only change through a political framework, and a post-growth economy can only be possible if the political framework is uh, established. The other question is the social political reserves, because uh, or restraints, because often it's said like, it is all correct what is formulated by these uh, growth detractors. Nevertheless, we cannot get out of this because we cannot uh, encourage people to reduce, and reduction would be the only answer to come out of this um, technological decoupling. So we have three levels in Germany so we, where change is propagated. The individual um, level, which is subsistence, lifestyle concepts and logics are formulated here to l live well instead of having too much, or it's even an uh, ethical um, component is here as well. and for people to not live beyond the need. So these are all concepts within the lifestyle of individuals. And then there is the intermediary level with, that deals with institutions and also innovations. And often it's being said that it's, a, it's been de the unconditioned basic income is demanded in order to really bring about a degrowth or to bring about a decline of the economy and to make it sustainable. Ulrich Schach, for example, they are strong uh, proponents of this idea. And then there's uh, the Commons idea as well. Sigrid Elfrech, she's also one uh, proponent of that. 
Christian Gellieritz uh, is here today as well. And then there's also the idea to create democratic institutions and to have cooperatives maybe to change or to or to, to to break this growth um, dogma. So we have political, uh, on the political level, for example, people are demanding, for example, the abolishment of ownership of property to decline or reduce growth. There is also the approach of monetary reforms. For example, may, maybe the money creation in banks are a growth uh, driver, and that can be changed also only through political institutions only. And of course, we can find a practical level as well here in this whole discussion. Let's think about the urban gardening um, um, projects or the repair shops, the commons-based uh, uh, logics, of, uh, the logic of sharing, for example, and all other concepts on a practical level. They cannot be um, categorized theoretically um, exactly. And then there is also another level in the middle. It's creating small islands, the eco-villages are emerging and are getting a lot of popularity. And there's also another concept from Switzerland. There, a group of people want to come together who are creating a microsystem with about 500 people, and they're trying to reduce their energy consumption. This is a very good approach. I want to mention another uh, concept, eco-socialism. And I was very happy to see Gerald Jacques offering a, concert, a, a workshop here on that topic because this is uh, sustainable and also looks at the issue of global justice. So we need political frameworks in order to implement all these practical uh, um, concepts that I've just uh, mentioned. And that keeps us busy, actually. This is for sure, it's not boring. Actually, it's fun. What about um, the main issues in Spain and Catalan and then in Italy? And I hope you agree if I give us 10 more minutes here, because we started 10 minutes later, in order to give you all the rest of the discussion then outside, but I don't want to interrupt Juan and uh, Mauro now and uh, let them um, <coughs> Let them speak, okay? Okay. <coughs> Four minutes. So many of the things are similar. For instance, in Spain there is a movement, uh, there is a movement called Eco Aldeas, villages using uh, villages which have been abandoned. Yeah. And, and this is very vigorous now. The crisis, so one important factor, of course, is the economic crisis, which is common, but which has meant about 10, 15 percent reduction in the average standard of living or money income, which of course has not been distributed equally at all, and a very high unemployment. So this is a factor, and this makes for some specificities. And one would be <coughs> the fact that uh, the question of the debt is becoming one important political issue, should have become an important political issue already, a few years ago, not to pay the debt or to have a yeah. debt audit, like they invented this in Ecuador and other Latin American countries, or in Germany in 1953, isn't it, when Herman Apps went to London and said, we cannot pay, pay all of it. Many things start in Germany in the whole course of uh, the history of humans, and in the last 200 years at least, and therefore, not paying the debt is something that people who are for the growth thing would be a very good thing to do. I want to go back to something that Nico said at the beginning, that in the 90s, 80s and 90s, after Brunland, there was a kind of period where the whole uh, ecological economic discussion went dead, although we were doing things and writing books, but politically when dead was when the neoliberals were triumphing, when, when uh, what's her name, Margaret Thatcher said, Tina, isn't it? I always say Tisana, there is an alternative. 
And when, for instance, uh, the, 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 the Bend Day came in Germany, I remember now today, today is the fifth, 25th anniversary of some movements here in Leipzig. Some they? movements in yes. Libya. Yes. So, and then in the 90s, nothing happened. And now, the debate in Spain, if you read the newspapers, the, the, the país, the main sort of newspaper, they say, Neoliberals is more or less dead or, or dying intellectually, in the imaginary, but Keynesianism is, go is going to save us and people read Krugman and Stiglitz and so on, or their local equivalents. So that the growth movement says neither neoliberalism nor Keynesianism. We don't want to have deficit spending. We don't want to increase the debts anymore. So financially, I think the idea of growing out of the crisis by making debts, which was, of course, the 30s and, and what we all learned in school in, in macroeconomics and so on. All this, I think, is hope, I hope, is debt. And what is coming back or should be uh, discussed everywhere in the degrowth movement is ideas which are prosperity without growth, or if you want the steady state, or the croissants going to a different kind of macroeconomy. Mm -hmm. And apart from the debt, if I have half a minute, mm -hmm. the other idea that there is general agreement also in the post-communist left, and there are some people here in the room from Spain, from the post-communist left, and they are becoming more really environmental, more eco-socialist, not just to put the label, thinking that they can win some extra votes, but because of the situation. And this idea of a basic citizen's or citizen's income as a human right is making great progress, I think, in the collective discussion also. Mm -hmm. Whether there will be the political, I am optimistic politically about Spain now because the, in the elections, in the European elections, we didn't move to the right, we moved to the left. And the whole Catalan question and Basque question is good also for Spain because if we split a little bit or we discuss the constitution again and so on, this is good for the country. To lose one province or two has always been good for Spain. Mm -hmm. And like Cuba or Puerto Rico. And, but apart from this, I mean, I am opt optimistic because I think there is a reaction after already six, seven years to the crisis and not, is not a reaction towards the right, is a reaction towards a kind of Republican left with a lot of this new party, Podemos, I'm not a member, but this new party, proposing things like this, a debt audit and also basic uh, citizen's income and a few other things like the big scandal that there are lots of empty flats and lots of people without a flat and house because of the absurd building boom that we had until 2007. So the, the absurdity of the economy is so obvious to everybody that something else has to come up. And uh, it will come up, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Non so, non vorrei gettare acqua sul fuoco. Well, I don't reduce the optimism here too much, actually. That's not my intention. Nevertheless, I must say that uh, many, many questions have been raised, and I don't know where to start. Now, the question that was raised earlier, it uh, basically was talking about the Bad Brigilio, which is a movement around that uh, person. I'm not an expert on uh, this in this field, and I don't know much about that, but there were many, many attempts in France and also in Italy. There were many attempts to found a degrowth party, and these attempts uh, took place too early and therefore failed. However, there are movements such as the movement of Pepe Grillo, and they are trying to appropriate our topics, basically, and also look at our topics. Now, with regard to us in Italy, in 
in our very small circle, we try to draft a manifesto. A manifesto that is not directed to elections and is not a political uh, uh, or does not have a political dimension because we are very aware that if we want to bring about change, what we shouldn't do, we shouldn't put our energy in the election campaign or party activities. What we need to do, we need practical cultural practices which are outside of the party landscape. Of course, there are many differences with regard to values and points of views when it comes to the different degrowth movements in France, in Italy, in Spain, and elsewhere. Still, we find differences, not necessarily with regard to values, but, but with regard to the organizational form, with regard to the organization, we see fragmentation happening within the different uh, practices uh, with regard to the subject. They still find it difficult to act together. Now, if we don't overcome these uh, factors and uh, fragmentation, we're not going to be able to create a common world and future or a common idea. And I truly believe that the term degrowth could be the term which brings together all these different practices in Europe. So therefore, I must say I'm optimistic, actually, or optimistic. The, this conference, the whole degrowth movement, moreover, is one of the very rare places where you still feel optimism. And this is still, to me at least, surprising that um, with the pictures of the world we get, that um, with a topic like ours, you hear optimism about future developments. Now, actually, the floor will be yours. In very, very shortly, let's say in three minutes, but I would like to ask these gentlemen here, before you leave and discuss with the public outside, why are you all so male? Warum sind Sie alle so männlich? Les femmes du mouvement n'ont pas été invitées à la tribune, je suppose. Non. Bonne réponse. D'accord. Well, women were not invited. Is that the reason why it's an all-male uh, panel? Well, this is quite a surprising uh, question. Well, I think it's a coincidence. I'm uh, a member of the... Association of Economic Ecology, and the, in that movement we had a lot of power women, and they are the ones who, uh, who, who built the foundation for me to carry on my work, and we could have invited so many other women who are mentioned earlier. I didn't know the gender of the other gentlemen here before I came or the other participants, I mean. So, but of course, I don't know whether Sabine O'Hara is here, but she was in the program, and she's uh, the next president of the International Society for Ecological Economics. Marina Fischer-Kowalski is the present president. Bina Garbal is the past president. So I think that, that there are, of course, but I mean, the organizers put our names here. Yeah. Oops, yeah. Yeah. I don't represent Catalonia or Spain, there are many people. How female is What? How female is Oh, in the, no, we are, we are not the Crescita Felice, uh, we are Associazione de Crescita. Uh, the Crescita Felice is the other one. Uh, anyway, the president is a male as well, yeah. so <laughs> no, well, uh, what, what can I say is Maybe if my companion was with me, yeah. she, she would be pleasure to, 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 okay. to be at my place. I mean, 
Why not? We can do it. Ich glaube, dass so viele Expertinnen im Raum sind, dass das Gespräch draußen an den Tischen gewiss jetzt auch auf diese Frage. Well, I think we have so many female experts uh, outside who can discuss with you the various topics as, uh, for example, in political institutionalization of the post-growth uh, discourse, shorter working hours and feminist aspects. And I would like to invite you all to carry on the discussion outside. Whoever needs to go should go. And I'm really, really grateful to you that you had so much patience. And what we need, we should uh, also, we need more time. Thank you so much for your time that you've given us. Thank you very much.